Hello, everyone, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland's annual meeting. My name is Alyssa Raybuck, and I am the Communications and Program Innovation Manager here at the City Club. And it is really exciting because I have my colleagues on stage with me, and instead of a panel of community experts, we're going to be hearing from uh, members of the City Club staff, um, who I hope are familiar faces to most of you. Um, and we're going to do things a little different. We're going to have a panel discussion about ourselves, which is not what we normally do. But uh, we're going to share a little bit about the work that we've done over the last year, some highlights, and what we're looking forward to in the future. And so I'm joined on stage today by my colleagues, uh, Tiffany Clay Claiborne, <laughs> Tiffany France, to many of you, but Tiffany Claiborne now, who is our um, manager of um, outreach and membership, uh, Cynthia Connolly, who is our director of programming, and I think on the end, most of you know Mr. Dan Walthrop, <laughs> our chief executive officer here at the City Club, right? A new guy. But we're really excited to be here, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I want to start by looking back at this time, a little earlier than this time last year, in, in summer of 2021. We were getting ready to uh, come back to in-person programming. We were going to bring um, this audience back to this room and to, and to other spaces across the community. So I'm going to start with Cynthia. Can you talk a little bit? You were new to the staff, yeah. <laughs> and we were about to start bringing people back in person. So what did that look like? Yeah, so um, I remember my I, I joined here in June um, of 2021, and one of the first forums that I did was actually the um, the the primary debate for District 11, um, and just kind of just you know baptism by fire, just like <laughs> here run this debate with all these really important people. Um, but it was a ton of fun, um, had an absolute blast, and that was one of the many times that I got to work with Jill Zyman um, of the Ohio Debate Commission, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but one of the very first forums that I had the privilege of working on was our public square forums. And it was the first public square back since the pandemic. And everyone was kind of uncertain, you know, what to do, how to pull this off. You know, are people still going to come, but it's outdoors. And um, we are so glad that we made that happen. And, and some of those conversations that we had were really impactful and relevant. We were talking about essential workers. Um, we had, uh, you know, a love letter to Cleveland talking about race and racism. And it was just a really impactful conversations and a lot of fun to work on. And we had a great turnout for all of them. And what a, I can't imagine a better way to kick off our, our in-person forums. Absolutely, it was, it was a, a nice way to ease back into bringing that community yeah. back in person in our audience. Yep. And, and Tiffany, you were kind of our, our manager in charge of safety, logistics, how we were going to bring the audience like we see today back in person at the City Club. So tell us about your experience yeah. doing that. So absolutely, like as the member and outreach manager, like my goal was to communicate how we were getting back. And it was, I wanted to put an emphasis that we cared about you all, that we wanted to make sure. So it, we, we wanted to like, you know, let everybody know about mass requirements and our vaccine rollout and how we were gonna handle that. So that was really important to us. And also just getting the community back in the room. So as I'm in charge of our community partnership and I wanted to make sure that our community partnership was at a, was at a core focus for the forum. So that is what I focused on. Thank you. Dan. Dan. Well, when we came back, you know, what, there were some lessons from the pandemic that we learned. Um, we had done at that point 15 months of purely online programming. Um, and we were like, I was so done with the <laughs> screen, the little screen. Um, and bringing people back um, to first to Public Square, then here in the room, um, everybody, it was, I think our first audience in here was like 75 people. And we were like, can we do this? Yeah. And we did. <laughs> Um, and it was fantastic, but one, you know, some of the lessons were uh, about our relevance. It was really clear that um, we heard again and again from people that thanks to, um, thanks to our ability to switch quickly to digital and to keep, and we didn't miss a single Friday forum thanks to our friends at IdeaStream Public yeah. Media, which was really nice. Um, where they immediately let us, I mean, when nobody was going into the office, they let me come into the studio and, uh, and a, couple, a few of us come into the studio so we could produce the forums from there. Um, and we heard again and again that we were provided, continuing to provide this really important service of keeping the community connected and keeping the community um, really, uh, like really just informed about what was happening. 
And, and that was such an isolating time. So knowing that the virtual audience, the online audience was um, so important, we have continued to, 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 to push that. And knowing too that we don't always have to have people on the stage, that, that when there's somebody important who we wanna hear from and they're in Washington and they can't make it, we can get them on the big screen here, put together a hybrid kind of production and still serve the community and still create these conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. So that was, I mean, from a programming standpoint, that was really mm -hmm. one of the, the biggest lessons. The other big lesson I just need to say too um, was had to do with the other things that we might be able to do. So um, we have, you know, in the, in the room, um, we have some folks from Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries or formerly from Lutheran Met Metropolitan Ministries. <laughs> and we started a partnership with them uh, during, during COVID that has continued. At first, it was all about just getting food out the door so that they could um, feed, you know, create 10,000 meals every week for um, the unhoused population, for our unhoused neighbors. And um, now we have uh, students from Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries who are training in our kitchen every week, thanks to Chef Adam. So, I mean, that's just a, th those sorts of programs we figured out, they were important then, we can continue to, mm -hmm. to use all of this for the greater good. Thanks, thank you for sharing that. Speaking of students, I do <laughs> wanna talk about um, a, a group that is prevalent in almost all of our forums. And, and when we returned to in-person programming, students were returning to the classroom in person and that meant students were being welcomed back to the city club and so uh, tiffany you manage our yeah. student engagement program can you talk a little bit about what you heard from teachers and students as they started to fill these seats as well yeah absolutely um, our students and teachers were excited they were excited to be back in the room and we were glad to have them um, they used our virtual programming for lesson plans so they when we were when we announced we were coming back they were excited to introduce those as field trips um, I have one teacher that gave me a testimonial that I want to read to you all. Um, it's from Lisa Ellis. She's an educator at MC2 STEM school, a CMSD school. She says, since the beginning of this year alone, our students have been able to attend seven in-person city club forums. For me, it is a gift to see our students and the issues they and their families face in their own lives and communities reflected in these forums. Most notably, we're coming out and coming of age and it takes a village. It is this reason we keep coming back, for our young people to recognize themselves and challenges they feel are uniquely theirs in a city club programming. It not only gives them hope for the future, but reminds them that there are people in their corner right now doing the good, hard work on their behalf. My hope is that they will feel inspired, empowered by this, and continue the work as they, they become adults. So this is why student programming is so important at the City Club and why we love having them back. Can I, can I just add something really quick? I mean, that program, Tiffany, that you run is so important. And I, what I always tell people is that the City Club is really one of the only places in our community where students are participating in civic life right alongside their adult counterparts. And they typically outperform their adult counterparts in <laughs> the quality of their questions. Yes. And, and it's like, and it really is. I mean, all of us have been wowed by those, by those questions that students ask sometimes. Yes. And, um, and those two forums, It Takes a Village was the Jasmine Long yes. Forum about birthing beautiful oh, communities. Yeah. And the, um, the coming out and coming of age was, there were these, these students, these, these teenagers on mm -hmm. the stage who identify uh, as part of the trans community, yeah. completely sharing in all their vulnerability and their strength what, um, what life is like for them. And that, it was just an extraordinary program. Yeah. Um, yep. Anyway, I'm so glad, <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry. No, yeah, yeah. no, but that's it. And, and that's the importance of our student participation. Our young citizens are, are very engaged and I'm happy to uh, oversee that program. Thanks, Tiffany. Yeah. Cynthia, it has been <laughs> A big political year, to say the least. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, your first one of your first forums was the District Eleven congressional yeah, yeah, debate. Yeah. We hosted mayoral primary yeah. and federal election debates. We, I think, we had fifteen candidates for office on this stage in the yeah. last year, yeah. and over thirty politics and public policy forums in that subject area. So. It was politics all the time at the City Club in addition to all of the other amazing programming we do. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and that area and, and yeah. some highlights from that? I mean, this is kind of some of the bread and butter of what City Club does, right? The politics, the policy, the civic engagement. And we worked very closely with our partners at IdeaStream Public Media to host the, the primary debates, the mayoral primary debates. So we hosted two of those, as well as one general election debate uh, between Kevin Kelly and now uh, Mayor Justin Bibb. 
and it was um, really incredible to be able to bring that to the people broadcasting live um, on TV. Uh, really vetting those questions from the community. These questions came directly from the people of Cleveland. Um, and to us, that was the most important. And it actually ended up becoming a model that we used to get some of the questions for the uh, county, the uh, Cuyahoga County uh, executive race, mm -hmm. uh, our debate that we had, uh, a, uh, was it last month? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, also for the state of the city, another um, a, a forum that we hosted with uh, Mayor Justin Bibb. So, really using that model of community engagement, getting into the neighborhoods that sometimes don't feel like they have their voice heard. And uh, we're really proud to be part of that, to do those debates. And then similarly, um, we had a forum on issue 24. I don't know if any of you were here for that one. It was about the, um, the charter amendment that was going to bring uh, more police accountability. And we actually had a panel of four individuals from complete opposite ends of the spectrum. We had the, the city uh, law director here. We had uh, a police captain here. We had Sabod Chandra, who drafted the charter, um, and uh, Prentice Haney, who was part of the o uh, Ohio Organizing Collaborative, who was really trying to get that uh, charter amendment um, on the ballot. And it was really interesting to have you know these these folks from varying backgrounds points of view have a very civil and candid conversation about what this means to the people of cleveland and to our, our neighborhoods and communities and so bringing forums like that is really what you know you know fills my bucket as i say it just like really grows my heart um and then also having uh the the republican and democratic party chairs here um again showing you how we can bring and it's very on theme for today's conversation, what we're going to have later on today uh, with uh, Robert Paduchik and, and uh, Liz Walters, the, the chairs of the Republican and Democratic parties. That really, that's where I think the City Club shines, and I was glad to be part of that. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Tiffany, I would like to talk to you a little bit about our membership. I think we are a unique organization that, since our inception, has been founded and grown by individual members, corporate members, nonprofit members, and many of you in the room <coughs> fall into those buckets. And, and we are just grounded by the work that our members do and volunteering for us. And Tiffany has really grown our member engagement over the last year. So can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, I just want to thank our members first and foremost, um, all our members mm -hmm. here, our board members, um, just for your engagement throughout this whole year. You've been here through it all through the pandemic virtual programming and then now back in person. So I, I want to say thank you. Um, you are our foundation and, um, and we're celebrating 110 years this week. So, you know, we all should be proud because we started <laughs> off as all men and now we're women, <laughs> men, every way, race, creed, gender, religion. So thank you. Um, but yeah, we're engaging our members through volunteers. So, a volunteer, a member volunteer might have checked you in today. Mm -hmm. And or later on, you'll see a member volunteer do Q&A. So our, that's something, the way that we engage with our members and they love doing it and we love having them here. And then also through our yearly round tables, which a lot of you were there. And um, the next one I think is gonna happen during the holidays, so stay tuned. <laughs> and um, I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> Dan, I know you love our members. I do you, love our members. You, I think we're all members. We're all yeah. also members I, of the City Club in addition are. to working we here, are. which is and very it was, cool. It was my engagement as a member, uh, as a as a member volunteer, that got me like hooked into all of this, mm -hmm. and eventually like got me interested in working here. But you know, one and when I started as a member volunteer, I was on a, one of the program committees, and that's another way that our members get deeply mm -hmm. involved. Um, Members, all of you, I have to say, thank you. Um, we had an extraordinarily successful year financially last year. Um, part of the job of this annual meeting is to, is, to, is to review the balance sheet and all of that. You guys were huge. You came through really big. And, um, and I really want to recognize our, our board members, our current board members and past board members. Many of you are here right now. If you could stand up for a second so we could all recognize you for all of the work, the fiscal kind of guidance that you provided. <laughs> Present and past, Len Calvary, stand up on, past board members should stand as well. Um, it was, uh, you know, if you, if you look through the, um, you know, the, there's a, right at your table, there's a, a, a little postcard and there's a QR code. You can look through our annual report. It's digital this year. And you'll get to those, um, to, to the expenses and the revenues and, and all of that. And you'll see, it was great. We had, um, we had about $2.1 million in revenue 
in, in the last fiscal year. Um, and a little over, and about, and just under, sorry, 1.8 million in expenses. Um, so I, I know like a lot of you are really good at math, so you've already figured out that that was a successful year. Um, and really, um, really one of the most successful. Your engagement and, um, was one of the reasons why that was. And our board members, um, I don't know how many of you realize this, but you know, if we get, if we receive um, every year um, somewhere between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars from our corporate community, our corporate partners, in support, our board members are con connected to close to four hundred thousand dollars of that, and that's really that's real meaningful work that, and contributions that they're doing. So, uh, on behalf of the staff, thank you to all of our board members, but also I, I think our our membership should know that as well. Um, and I, I should also sort of acknowledge too that part of the reason that was successful is many nonprofit organizations found that the government assistance through the Paycheck Protection Program was also something that buoyed us as well. So if you were wondering if that program worked, the answer is yes, it worked. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's kind of the, the, yeah. the financial picture as well. Mm -hmm. And I know something that we've talked about is that we also had 100% staff retention. We did. We did. So Thank, we're all still thanks, here. guys. We're all still yeah, here and thanks. hanging out with you. Yeah. yeah. Made, made my job a lot easier. <laughs> not going to lie. Okay. So we're going to, I, something that we say as a team a lot is that the city club is, is more of a spirit than a place. Um, you know, most of our forums take place in this home at 850 Euclid Avenue, but uh, we go out into the community and host forums. We mentioned Public Square as our return to in-person programming last year. And we, we find ourselves in a lot of different homes in the community. And Cynthia, um, you're planning programs in, in new spaces all the time. So can you talk about some of our, our different homes throughout the last yeah. year? So I actually looked back at our forums and realized that we started the fiscal year and ended the fiscal year in the community, not here at 850 Euclid. And to me, that really is a testament of, you know, the importance of, of getting out of this building. I know we all love having, you know, a you know, nice lunch here by <laughs> chef and, you know, hanging out with everyone here. But it's really important that we get into the community. I know that's one of my personal goals and, and Dan, our, our goal. And um, one of the first and foremost things I hear from our member committees, uh, we have the health, we have uh, debate, we have general programming, education, uh, global issues. Uh, those are our five member committees and they're all about getting into the community. Uh, one of the most powerful forums that we had was actually at Morningstar Baptist Church on the east side of Cleveland and that was in partnership with our friends at the St. Luke's Foundation as part of their health equity series and uh, their 25th anniversary. And we had a panel of four uh, local community members who were doing amazing work in power building, in um, civic engagement. It was moderated by uh, Erica Anthony with Cleveland Votes. And being able to see uh, us lift up those voices and be in the community, be with people who might not always be able to get here at lunchtime uh, on Euclid Avenue. So that was really important. I think we'll be doing a lot more of those. Did, um, you, did you know, by the way, that one of the p panelists is now um, about to be appointed to, just to circle this back to issue 24. Yeah, one yeah. Of these one of the panelists is about Adriana to be appointed, Ro Rodriguez, is about Rodriguez. to be appointed yeah, to, that, yeah. so to the Charter Commission. Yeah. yeah, so it's really cool to see kind of like that full circle. And then also we're back at Happy Dog. Uh, we had, every, if anyone has been to Happy Dog for our forums, it, it's really a moment to like let down your hair. Uh, the mm -hmm. conversations can be a little more raw. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Stan. <laughs> and it's, you get tater tots and, and hot dogs with Fruit Loops on it while you're talking about global issues. Uh, but we actually pivoted a little bit. It used to be just world affairs, and now we're taking on everything at Happy Dog. And so we use that as an opportunity to respond to some of the more current affairs and pressing issues that we see in our community. Uh, for example, just next week, we're going to be talking about participatory budgeting, um, which uh, I personally think is a fascinating topic. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's all about engaging civically. You can vote as a, as a citizen, but how else can you engage civically to represent your people? And, and uh, participatory budgeting is that. It's, and it's way more interesting with beer. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So we're back at the Happy Dog too, which is a lot of fun, and I think shows you uh, we can have these very serious, real conversations, but in a, more of a low-key way. Thanks, Cynthia. And I know that a lot of the forums you mentioned our member committees, but um, Tiffany manages a network of eighty community partners yep. who help us both with 
the people that we put on stage, getting audience members. How does the community partner program work and, and how, did, how did you use that in the last year? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, like we, we started off with a strong focus on community partnership. What that means is reaching out to nonprofits, particularly grassroots organizations, that mission and purpose aligns with the forum's topic. And so that's what I do for every forum. I do my research, I see who needs to be in the room, and we assign community partners and they, they jump on, they do a promotion for us, and then they, fill, they help fill the room with the community. And that was really important to us, and every forum that you've seen, even today's forum, has been filled by community partners with community people that need to be a part of the conversation. Um, so shout out to Plexus, who is here today, <laughs> and also Perfect. Facing History Cleveland. Um, who's here in YWCA, so thank you. Um, and our community partnership, they really uphold our mission of creating conversations of consequence and also continuing the conversation. So that's why we do this. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna switch gears real quick to a speed round of questions because I'm gonna have a little, I little bit of fun. About this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's Cleveland slash City Club themed. Okay. Okay, we're just gonna go down the line. I'm gonna start with Tiff. Oh, Lord. Cynthia, yeah. Dan, and we're going to go through. Okay, you're coming to the City Club for lunch. Are you getting a salad or the hot meal? <laughs> I'm more of a hot meal. Okay. Immediately hot meal. Okay. Hot. Always wow, hot. I'm a salad girl. I, okay. I just, chef makes a good salad. Okay, you're looking at your table. You're seeing what your neighbors have. What dessert are you taking? The lemon square? The lemon square or the brownie? I'm a brownie. Yeah? Brownie. I'm brownie too, yeah. <laughs> oh my god! No. Yeah. I get in arguments, I get in a lot, no, no, it's, a, it's this ongoing like manufactured, it's a, Twitter. it's a manufactured Twitter war about lemon squares it with is. Joe Simperman. Yeah. But, um, but no, but it was actually, you know, you can trade desserts. This was inspired by Merle Johnson. I saw her, I saw her unhappy with like whatever was in front of her and she started to reach for a cookie and I, and I just, if you don't like what's in front of you, it's a trade good reason. With your to, it's fellowship. It's dessert fellowship. Yeah, it's barter, trade. barter for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've had your lunch, you've had your dessert. They're doing it. They're trading. You're getting ready to leave. Are you taking the elevator or the stairs to the parking garage? Stairs. 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 That's like yeah. no brainer. I know. Yeah. Okay. You can only pick one professional sports team in Cleveland. Browns, <sighs> Cavs, Guards. Cal Who do you pick? All of them, but I'm a brownie. Okay. Yeah. Dessert and in sports. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Cynthia? Uh, you're, okay, Michigan. Wait, 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 what? I totally went off script. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's okay. my alma mater. That wasn't I can't. An <laughs> I can't. That's okay. Dan? The Cavs. Cabs. Kevin okay. Crane's in the room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so final um, speed round. You have to sport City Club in the community. Are you wearing a baseball cap or are you wearing a beanie? I'm a beanie. Beanie? Definitely a baseball cap. Beanie. Yeah. Beanie. Well, it's cold. I, I <laughs> know. I mean, winter aside. Okay, so quick side note. <laughs> After many, many years of all of us on the team wanting to have City Club merch, we now have City Club merch. We've got tote <laughs> bags, we've got umbrellas, we've got hats, we've got all the things. So after today's program, across the lobby in the Mandel room, come and buy some swag. It's very fun. Yeah. Rep the City Club and all things. So we're very excited about that. Um, that ends our really quick speed round, but I just want to take a moment and go through each of your kind of highlights of gratitude over the last year. What was something that you're most grateful for at the City Club? Tiffany? Grateful for my job. I know that it's like cliche, <laughs> but like I am. And um, just for you all, just like seeing your beautiful faces. I really love coming to work and like engaging with everyone and meeting new people. And um, my t like our team, we have such a close team, and we're all we're all so like we're like friends. So I'm grateful for that. I am uh, really grateful for my first full year here at, at City Club, my first <laughs> fiscal year, um, it, just being welcomed by not only my staff here, the board, um, but also the members. It's been a, such a joy to me to be able to meet each and every one of you. Some of you I knew before I started working here, but it's every week I'm meeting new faces and new people, and it really just makes this job a lot of fun. There's a, a relevance, I mentioned this word before, relevance to, to the work that we do. Um, and I'm grateful to have that kind of work. 
I'm grateful that like you know that people send me I and mean, people send me so many ideas and uh, and honestly sometimes it's like oh my god another email with an idea, but um, but it is um, but this is what we're here for you know so um, it's just exciting to be to be able to provide this platform it's such a privilege it's such a privilege to be able to provide this platform for the community um, and so I'm grateful for that for that opportunity. Thank yeah. you everyone. What are you grateful for? Oh, oh, you guys, you're the best. Um, yeah, I, this, this team on the hardest of days has your back. And so it makes really joyful days like today easier and really challenging days um, easier too. So you guys are the best. Um, finally, Dan, yeah. what's happening in the year ahead? Anything to highlight? Cool forums? What's there's, going on? There's a lot of, there's, look, our whole community is at this kind of pivotal moment. This, um, this moment where, you know, where it's an inflection point for our whole community. There's a lot of leadership changes happening. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a renewed yeah. sort of civic energy, I think, that is, might, might not be dissimilar, to use too many negatives, to the progressive era and that kind of spirit of civic engagement and what Newton D. Baker referred to as civitas. And we're also thinking about how we can better serve the community as well, both in our programming, we think about you know, what is it going to take to ensure that we have democracy in the year 2100. I hate to put that big question in front of you, but it's not a given, right? And that's partly <laughs> what we're talking about today by, uh, by, with Dave Isay, who walked in here. You probably figured out that that was Dave Isay when he walked in. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but, um, but also, so, so how we can better serve the community, both in the programming that we provide and, and the way that we provide it and the platform that we give it and the space that we create for it. So, um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's what we're thinking about. And um, we do have some big things we're thinking about, some big things we're planning. Um, so look forward to some big announcements soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so with that, trade your desserts. Um, say hi to people at your table that you might not know and uh, lunch will be served in the next few minutes and we will be back at noon for our Friday Forum with Dave Isay and our annual meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> Good job. All right.
Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It's Friday, October 28th, and I'm Kristen Beard Adams, President of the City Club Board of Directors. I'm particularly excited to be here today as we mark the City Club of Cleveland's 110th annual meeting, which also is the Samuel O. Friedlander Memorial Forum on Free Speech. So it's particularly fitting that we welcome to our podium Dave Isay, who, as many of you know, is the founder and president of StoryCorps, a fascinating public service rooted in the belief that every story and every voice matters. Since launching in 2003, StoryCorps has provided more than a half a million Americans with the opportunity to, in Dave's words, record meaningful conversations about their lives and pass wisdom from one generation to the next. The StoryCorps archives at the Library of Congress is the single largest collection of human voices ever gathered, illustrating that more often than not, we find common points of interest rather than those that divide us. You could argue that StoryCorps' work has never been more important, nor is the impact of its one small step initiative, which you'll hear more about today, that brings strangers together with different political views for recorded conversations, not to debate politics, but to learn about who we are as people. You see, this idea of bringing people together from different backgrounds, beliefs, and political leanings has been, at the, has been the work of the City Club since our inception in 1912. In fact, the City Club's first professional staff member, Ralph Hayes, penned in 1916 the City Club's creed, and we thought that it provided some important context for our conversation today, and we're going to share just a bit of the first few lines. I hail and harbor and hear persons of every belief and party, for within my portals prejudice grows less and bias dwindles. I am the product of the people, a cross-section of their community, weak as they are weak and strong in their strength, believing that knowledge in our, of our failings and powers begets greater strength. I have a house of fellowship. Under my roof, informality reigns, and strangers need no introduction. So here we are in our house of civic fellowship, of civic, civil civic dialogue, where prejudice grows less and bias dwindles. And despite the last line about not needing introductions, we are excited to introduce Dave Isay, founder and president of StoryCorps. If you have a question for Dave, you can text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet your question at the City Club, and the staff will do its best to work it into the program. Members, friends, and guests of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming StoryCorps founder and president, Dave Isay. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here um, at, at the City Club, and hello, IdeaStream listeners. Um, so today, today I'm going to talk about StoryCorps and uh, play a bunch of stories and, as Kristen said, talk about this new effort that we've launched around political polarization. Uh, but um, before I do, I'm curious, who, who here listens to StoryCorps, knows what StoryCorps is? Okay. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay. Recorded an interview? Okay. Couple. Okay. All at one table. Uh, <laughs> all right. Members of IdeaStream? All right. Good. All right. I like that. Uh, and have no idea why you're listening to me and are waiting to get back to work. <laughs> okay. Somebody's lying. Uh, no hands. Um, so, uh, uh, so StoryCorps, as, as Kristen said, um, 
is uh, I, I was a public radio producer for many decades before starting StoryCorps, always interested in the public service value of, of radio, for better or worse, more so than, than en the entertainment value. And had this, loved doing radio documentaries, had this crazy idea 19 years ago this week, actually, we put a booth in Grand Central Terminal where you can bring anyone who you want to honor by listening to their story, a parent, a friend, a grandparent. You come to the booth with, say, your grandma, um, go inside, you're met by a facilitator who works for StoryCorps, door shuts, you're in this kind of sacred space, the lights are low, complete silence, and for 40 minutes you listen and you talk to your loved one. Um, most people think of it as if I had 40 minutes left to live, what would I say to this person who means so much to me? Everybody cries in the booth. Um, and I knew from doing radio documentaries that the microphone gives you the license to say things and to ask things that you have never asked before. So, um, so they're very intense conversations. At the beginning of StoryCorps, actually, the booth was empty. Nobody could figure out what, quite what we were doing. But eventually, when we started broadcasting on public radio, it got very popular. And as Kristen said, we've had about, we've had about 650, 700,000 people across America participate so far. And essentially, because of what's happening in the booth, um, where people are talking about what's most important in their lives, it's, it's 40 minutes to you know, leave a record to future generations. Every interview goes to the Library of Congress your great-great-grandkids are going to hear this. Um, we're kind of collecting the wisdom of humanity. So let's just start by, by playing and listening to a few stories. I'm going to, we, we launched in New York, slow at the beginning, got very popular, and then we became a national project. And we have these Airstream trailers that travel around the country that are mobile recording booths, collecting, honoring, the, that's all everyday Americans, honoring the stories of everyday Americans. So um, the first story we're going to play is from um, Jackson, Mississippi. And um, this is um, Aiden Sykes, who's in fourth grade, and his dad, Albert. Um, and um, and uh, we're just going to hear three minutes of their 40-minute conversation. This is a sample of what happens in a story kaboo. So if we can go to the next slide and hit play on the story. Do you remember it or saw me? I remember when the doctor pulled you out. The first thing I thought was that he was being too rough with you. And he actually held you like a little Sprite bottle. And he was like, here's your baby. That was the most proud moment in my life. Don't tell your brothers because it's three of y'all. But it was like looking at a blank canvas and just imagining what you want the painting to look like at the end. But also knowing you can't control the paint strokes. You know, the fear was just, I got to bring up a black boy in Mississippi, which is a tough place to bring up kids, period. But there are statistics that say black boys born after the year 2002 have a one in three chance of going to prison. And all three of my sons were born after the year 2002. So, Dad, why do you take me to protest so much? <laughs> I think I thank you for a bunch of reasons. One is that I want you to see what it looks like when people come together, but also that you understand that it's not just about people that are familiar to you, but it's about everybody. Did you know the work that Martin Luther King was doing was for everybody and it wasn't just for black people? Yes, I understand that. Yeah, so that's how you got to think. If you decide that you want to be a cab driver, then you got to be the most impactful cab driver that you can possibly be. Are you proud of me? Of course. You my man. I, I just love everything about you, period. The thing I love about you, you never give up on me. That's one of the things I will always remember by my dad. Uh, you said it like I'm on the way out of here or like I'm already to go. So, Dad, what are your dreams for me? My dream is for you to live out your dreams. It's an old proverb that talks about when children are born, children come out with their fists closed because that's where they keep all their gifts. And as you grow, your hands learn to unfold because you're learning to release your gifts to the world. And so for the rest of your life, I want to see you live with your hands unfolded. So idea stream listeners, you heard the story. There's an animation that's playing here, and that's what's going to happen um, throughout the, the hour. Um, 
What do I want to say about that? I think StoryCorps in many ways is the opposite of reality TV. Um, nobody comes to get rich, nobody comes to get famous, it's just an act of generosity and love. And people often um, talk about crying when they hear StoryCorps stories. And like this one, you know, the, the, most StoryCorps stories aren't sad. Um, but I think that it's so rare that we get to hear people being genuine and authentic with each other with no ulterior motive that you're almost walking on holy ground when you hear people having this act of generosity, looking a loved one in the eyes and saying, um, you matter and, and you won't be forgotten, um, which um, causes uh, people to cry unexpectedly at funny stories. Like I, sometimes I don't quite know what to say. I am gonna play up a hard story though. So um, um, uh, be prepared for that. And I'm gonna do that now. Um, I hear there's an election coming up in Ohio. Um, <laughs> And uh, this is, oh, thank you for putting that slide up. So um, this, this is a story that I've thought about a lot in recent months. It speaks to great political leadership. Um, it's about the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. And for listeners, we're seeing a still of Bobby Kennedy on the floor uh, in Los Angeles after he'd been assassinated. And there's a young man cradling his head in a white busboy's jacket. Um, he looks to be about 17 or 18. Um, and um, this is a famous photograph that was taken seconds after uh, Bobby Kennedy was shot. Um, uh, the busboy was a Mexican immigrant named Juan Romero, um, an undocumented immigrant. Um, at StoryCorps, uh, Romero remembered how he met S Senator Kennedy the night before he was killed while delivering his room service. Um, so let's start there and, and listen to the story. They opened the door and the senator was talking on the phone. He put on the phone and says, come on in, boys. You can tell when he was looking at you that he's not looking through you. He's taking you into account. And I remember walking out of there like I was 10 feet tall. The next day, he had his victory speech. So they came down the service elevator, which is behind the kitchen. I remember extending my hand as far as I could. And then I remember him shaking my hand, and as he let go, somebody shot him. I kneeled down to him and put my hand between the cold concrete and his head just to make him comfortable. I could see his lips moving, so I put my ear next to his lips, and I heard him say, is everybody okay? I said, yes, everybody's okay. I could feel a steady stream of blood coming through my fingers. I had a rosary in my shirt pocket, and I took it out, thinking that he would need it a lot more than me. I wrapped it around his right hand, and then they wheeled him away. The next day, I decided to go to school. I didn't want to think about it. But this woman was reading the newspaper, and you can see my picture in there with the senator on the floor. She turned around and showed me the picture and says, This is you, isn't it? And uh, I remember looking at my hands, and there was dry blood in between my nails. Then I received bags of letters addressed to the busboy. There was a couple of angry letters. One of them even went as far as to say that if he hadn't stopped to shake your hand, the senator would have been alive. So I should be ashamed of myself for being so selfish. It's been... Uh, long, 50 years, and I still get emotional, uh, tears come out. But I went to visit his grave in 2010. I felt like I needed to ask Kennedy to forgive me for not being able to stop those bullets from harming him. And I felt like, you know, it would be a, a sign of respect to buy a suit. I never owned a suit in my life. And so when I wore the suit, and I stood in front of his grave. I felt uh, a little bit like the first day that I, that I met him. I felt important, I felt American, and I felt good. So a few things to say about that story. Um, so uh, Mr. Romero and his wife recorded together 
couple of weeks before the 50th anniversary of um, of um, uh, Bobby Kennedy's assassination, and um, it was about a month later he he passed away suddenly, unexpectedly. So it's kind of a reminder, you know, not to wait. That if you have a loved one who you are interested in in interviewing and want to talk to, you really want to just grab that moment and 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 do it. Um, it's also, I mean, I think uh, Studs Terkel, who um, when I who 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 remembers who Studs Terkel was? Okay, that's good because sometimes I do speeches and nobody raises their hands, and that makes me very sad. Um, Studs Terkel was a great oral historian from Chicago, uh, who who at 93 cut the ribbon on our first booth um, in Grand Central Terminal. And he was a big proponent of history from the bottom up. And that's what we just heard with, with uh, Mr. Romero, that you know, so often history is told through you know, states people and politicians. But the, the value and the, and the texture that we get from hearing about history through um, everyday people, I think, is, is incredibly valuable. I, I, we got a letter at StoryCorps right after Mr. Romero died um, and, and um, from someone who uh, said, I, I don't have the letter with me, I, I wish I had brought it, but he had, on the, on the 50th anniversary, it turns out Mr. Romero flew again to Arlington National Cemetery to pay tribute to Bobby Kennedy, and he snuck in, as did this guy um, who wrote the letter, right before the gates closed, and he had his suit on again, and he sat crying at, at, at President Kennedy's um, grave, and, and the man asked who he was, and he said, I was a person who cradled President Kennedy's head, and and the, the, the young man said, well, you know, I was, he's my hero. And, and Juan Romero said, I'm glad he's still remembered. And then he died. He died a week later. But he did. The, the, the letter writer wanted us to know that Mr. Romero got to say goodbye to uh, President Kennedy one more time. Um, I, I, I'll play something lighter for you guys now. <laughs> um, and we're going to move to Ohio now. Um, this is, um, this is a, um, this takes place in Ohio. It's a 94-year-old named uh, Betty Jenkins, uh, who came to one of our StoryCorps booths, Airstream Trailers, um, to talk about a newfangled contraption that she got from her mother uh, 70 years before, uh, an inflatable bra. So let's listen to <laughs> Betty Jenkins. I was very skinny, and I didn't have any curves. I guess my mother got kind of worried because she didn't think I had enough boyfriends. So she bought me a bra that you blow up. I was real excited. So I blew and blew to about 32. I was quite happy with the looks. I got a few wolf whistles. Of course, at that age, you were very self-conscious. That year, I took a trip to South America. I proceeded to fly to Santiago. Soon we were into the Andes Mountains, and it turned out that it was a non-pressurized plane, and I felt very uncomfortable. Things were getting very tight. This bra had started to increase in size. As the thing got bigger, I had tried to stand up, and I couldn't see my feet. The direction said it would go to 48 if I wanted to. I thought, what will happen if it goes beyond 48? And I found out what happened. It blew out. It was a loud, resounding sound, and the co-pilot came into the cabin with the gun wondering what had happened. The man all pointed to me. Well, it's difficult to explain to people in English that part of your anatomy just blew up, but to try and do it in Spanish, it's beyond hope. So they made a landing. I was taken off the plane and turned over to two women police and they told me to strip, hunting for what they thought was the bomb. When I stripped down, I showed them the hole in the bra, and they chuckled. And I thought, oh my, they've gotten the point. And I was allowed back on the plane. A month later, 
I got a bill from the airline for $400 for an unscheduled stop. Betty Jenkins. All right, now getting closer to home. A story from Cleveland. Um, uh, Michael Ryan is a juvenile court judge, and like many of the people he encounters uh, in court, he did not have an easy childhood. At StoryCorps, he told his son, who is also named Michael, what it was like growing up in a turbulent household and how it made him the person he is today. So let's listen to Judge Ryan. My mom was about four feet, 11. She had big brown eyes, beautiful smile, and soft lips. I remember those when she kissed me. I adored my mom, but she was addicted to heroin. My mother, you know, my stepdad, they were more concerned about that next high than necessarily whether or not we were going to school. I saw a lot of things that kids should not ever witness. I saw, you know, your grandmother being thrown up against walls, slammed on the floor, slammed outside on the concrete. And the way I used to try to escape is I go outside, played a lot by myself with the little football that I had, just throw it up and play just to stay away. And I could go into a library and read every single book that they had in there to find a way to escape from reality. And so with you, I do just the opposite of what my parents did. You know, when you were born, aside from the doctors, I was the first person to hold you and kiss you and talk to you. I would give you the shirt off my back, my underwear, my socks. I would go stark naked just so that you could be clothed. And I make sure that you eat before I eat, no matter what. Is that why sometimes you get upset when I skip breakfast? Oh, yeah, <laughs> because there were many times when I was little that we just didn't eat. And I think that's why I'm probably tougher than some other parents. You're sometimes overbearing, but I know where you're coming from, Dad. I have your name, so I have to set a good example. Only times I want to see you is at home and my games. I don't want to see you in court. I've told you many times, I want more for you than I do for myself. You have been a wonderful son, and I love being your dad. <laughs> I love being your son. <laughs> So I, I had the pleasure of meeting Judge Ryan today and actually eating lunch with him because he's right here uh, at the table. So if you could please give him and Mrs. Ryan a round of applause. <laughs> Michael is, um, is uh, working today out of town. Um, we, we send him our love and um, he recently got married as did their, um, their daughter. So um, it's uh, an honor, like probably the best part of my job uh, is getting to meet people in stories. So about three days ago, I, I was preparing for this, and I knew I was coming to Cleveland, and I looked in the archive, and I heard this story, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> We've got to get Judge Ryan here. And my whole, my whole staff remembered him, and they called him, and here he is. Um, uh, so we're, we're honored. Thank you. Um, uh, I am going to talk about One Small Step now, um, which um, is... Uh, the, our, our latest effort, um, Kristen uh, talked about it briefly at the top, and um, and is so aligned with the city club's uh, ethos and 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 values of uh, free speech and 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 you know protecting our democracy. Uh, so, you know, I, I I've been privileged over the last 19 years running StoryCorps, having a front row seat, uh, and watching who we are as Americans, people like Judge Ryan and Mrs. Ryan and and Michael. And uh, frankly, I'm in agony seeing what's uh, happened to the country. Um, it's, it's a little bit corny to say, um, but uh, StoryCorps is a nonprofit in the human connection business. And five years ago, five, six years ago now, we started becoming increasingly concerned about the chasms that were opening up across the political divides uh, and the growing culture of contempt across the divides in the United States. Our concerns were never about arguing or disagreeing, 
but about um, people across the divide seeing one another as less than human, the dehumanization that's um, started to really spiral out of control. Um, the problem that's called affective polarization has gotten um, much worse since we started thinking about it. My wife said to me a couple of weeks ago that when we started it was a two alarm fire and now it's the World Trade Center. Um, you've seen the polls, half of the country says it's more, it's likely we'll see a civil war in this country in our lifetime. Um, more than half of all Americans say the greatest threat to our country comes from our fellow citizens. 15% of Democrats and 20% of Republicans say the nation would be better off if large numbers of Americans from the opposing party just died. We've gone from disagreeing with one another to hating one another, which poses a very serious threat to this country because a democracy can't survive in a swamp of mutual contempt. So we started thinking about whether there was a way that we could use what we'd learned over the years to make at least a small dent in the problem. Our Hippocratic Oath is to do no harm to participants. Um, so we've spent six years um, testing and developing a new kind of interview methodology. Um, we started putting strangers across the divide together for story core conversations. All of the hundreds of thousands of interviews we'd done before that were people who knew and loved each other. So these are strangers across the divide um, for 50 minute conversations, not to, not to debate politics, but just to get to know each other as human beings under the premise that it's hard to hate up close. Uh, we tested and refined the new kind of interview methodology over the years and called it One Small Step. I'm going to play a quick animation that speaks to um, the spirit of the effort. Uh, this is Joseph Widenick, um, who's a laid off sheet metal worker who showed up in an anti-Trump protest in Austin at, um, in a Make America Great Again hat. Amina Amdin, who was a student at UT, was one of the marchers uh, at the protest that day. And they came to StoryCorps to remember the moment that brought them together. Let's watch. I noticed you with the hat. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you were surrounded by some people. And I noticed that they were being kind of threatening. And then somebody snatched your hat off your head. And that's the point where I something kind of snapped inside me because <laughs> I wear a, um, a Muslim hijab and I've been in situations where people have tried to snatch it off my head. Wow. And I rushed towards you and I just started screaming, leave him alone, give me that back. I don't think we could be any further apart as people and yet it was just kind of like this common, that's not okay moment. You are genuinely the only Muslim person I know. I just, it's not that I've actively avoided, it's just, yeah. I've just never been in the position where I can uh, interact mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. So I guess my views on uh, the Muslim community have been influenced by a lot of the news articles and, and things of that nature. I feel like a lot of times in the media, you don't see the normal Muslim, the one that listens to classic rock like I do. <laughs> you don't, you don't meet that Muslim. Can you tell me about where you grew up? What was that part of your life like? So I was born in Baghdad, in Iraq. I moved to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. Okay. Being uh, a Muslim girl, I stood out in almost every single way that you can <laughs> in middle school, the worst time to stand out. What about you? How was it like when you grew up? I was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a vastly different experience socially. It was, I didn't have... I guess as many friends as most people would. I only went to public school one year of my life and I got in three fights and I lost all of them. <laughs> I actually lost a lot of friends because of the selection, because of my political stance. So I hope that I can be the reason that someone decides to talk to someone as opposed to just cutting them out of their life or blocking them on Twitter, yeah. you know? I'd like for this to encourage other people to engage in more conversations yeah. with people that you don't agree with. That's what it's all about. I'm so glad I wasn't the only one who felt like that. So that was kind of an inspirational story that led to One Small Step, which officially launched last year in, um, in three cities, uh, Wichita, Richmond, and Fresno, the first of what we hope will be a slew of cities across the country, maybe uh, even someday Cleveland. Um, cities that demonstrate to the rest of the nation that it's possible to see each other as human beings across the political divides, despite what we may see on 24-hour news. Um, I have to see, say that what we've seen since 
launching is incredibly uh, encouraging. Uh, if you could put up the next um, slide. For radio listeners, I put up a slide of uh, the five um, uh, uh, people in what we call our brain trust, social psychologists, pollsters, experts in conflict mediation, who've been working closely with us on one small step over the years. Uh, for those in the audience, Dr. Jennifer Richeson is the second from the right on that slide. Um, she's a MacArthur winning social psychologist who's studying the impact of the one small step interviews. Uh, the experience of two people coming together, strangers coming together at her lab at Yale, um, uh, uh, and uh, seeing what happens when two people, two strangers come together and have these conversations. What we've seen is beyond anything that I'd hoped for. Um, most of these conversations between strangers end in exactly the same way, with the participants feeling like they've become friends and wanting to get to know each other even better. Um, one small step is based on something called contact theory, which may be the most studied theory in the history of psychology developed by a psychologist named Gordon Alport in the 1950s that says that when two enemies come together face to face for a conversation um, under very specific circumstances, at the end of that conversation, that um, sense of hate can melt away and they can see each other in a, in, as friends, ideally. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to achieve that, but with a lot of work from the team at StoryCorps, I think we have um, figured out a methodology that um, kind of is contact theory at its highest and, and best use. I'm gonna play, um, uh, we, we've also been creating snippets of audio, of course, um, out of these interviews to share back with the country to try and social norm the idea that it's okay, um, maybe even kind of wonderful to talk to people who have um, different beliefs than you who are strangers. Um, this is a public health campaign that we'll be launching in the coming years to try and shift social norms um, because when people see others engaging in a positive behavior, uh, those behaviors become contagious, we know from many psychological studies. Unfortunately, contempt and violence can also become contagious, which we know all too well. So I'm gonna play you just one of the, the excerpts. This is not a regular story core story like the one we've been listening to. Um, this is just an opportunity to eavesdrop on two people across the political divides getting to know each other as human beings. Um, and just a note before we start it that as part of this process, each of the participants gets a bio of the other participant with their first name um, and, um, and a paragraph about who they are. So um, let's, let's, um, let's hit play, and I'm going to read the cards to the radio audience that show up. It says, what happens when two strangers with opposing political views sit down for a conversation about their lives, not politics? You're about to find out. Let me ask you this. When you read my bio, mm -hmm. what did you think? And please be as honest as you feel comfortable because nothing um, would bother me. So the first part, my mind kicked into stereotype. She's mm -hmm. probably dyed in a wool Democrat. End of story. <laughs> Second part was intriguing because you said something along the lines of an open mind. I thought, well, this would be interesting. When I read your bio, I just thought you were a white man. <laughs> I thought I was going to come in here and just... I don't like, even know okay. what it was. I don't even I, remember what it was. And that, that's what's so interesting to me, <laughs> is that I'm just like... Stereotype. Wait, that's exactly right. So I have to admit it, and I appreciate you receiving yeah. that and allowing me to admit my stereotype. Because when you walked in the door and you stood up and introduced myself, I was like, oops, <laughs> oops, oops. <laughs> I don't feel threatened. I hope you don't feel threatened. Um, what, once we leave this, this conversation, uh, I hope, I believe, we'll have other conversations with others, may revisit, maybe your wife and my husband and four of us can get together and continue yeah. your conversation. But my point is that, what are we afraid of? And a card identifies them as David and Cassandra in, from Birmingham, Alabama. It says, one small step believe it's our patriotic duty to see the humanity in people with whom we disagree. Uh, join us at one small, take one small step .org. So one of the pe one of the people from the expert slide that I showed a couple of minutes ago is Tim Dixon, who is uh, the world's leading authority on the drivers of polarization in societies around the globe. He co-founded a group called uh, More in Common, and in recent years, the organization, for obvious reasons, has spent a lot more time studying um, the United States. Uh, a few years ago, he coined the phase the exhausted majority. Um, he found that most of the country, about 86% of it, 
is sick of polarization, scared about our future, and looking for a way out. So I'm going to show you some research that More in Common has just completed. You'll be the first uh, people in the world to uh, see it. Um, over the, the summer and the fall, up until October, Tim and his team have been studying one small step interview excerpts like the one that we just watched. Um, uh, so a few, a very few of the findings that have come in. Um, the idea stream listeners, I'm showing some slides, I'll give you the headline. Um, in this slide, general findings about the state of our union. Nine in 10 Americans feel the country is more divided than it's ever been. If you could go to the next slide. The good news is that nine in 10 Americans want to learn about the experience of people across the political divides. Next slide. Uh, more in common tested the mission and language of One Small Step and found that three out of four Americans, regardless of political beliefs, support the work. If you go to the next slide. Um, on the content we're creating, about 80% of Democrats and Republicans are moved by the content. Um, uh, independents less so, about 60%. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, uh, this is a slide that uh, is one of the slides that's really exciting to us on the One Small Step team. About 42% of Americans say they'd be interested in participating in a One Small Step interview, but that number rises to 62% after they've seen a One Small Step story like the one we just watched. So exposure to One Small Step content increases Americans' willingness to record an interview by almost 50%. So that's where we're at with One Small Step. Uh, as it said at the card, uh, that we uh, just watched. Uh, it is, we, we, um, our dream is to convince the country it's our patriotic duty to see the humanity in people with whom we uh, disagree. Um, we know this is the moonshot of all moonshots. Um, we have no illusions about how hard this is. We know there's a $100 billion hate industrial complex of media and social media out there that is making a lot of money uh, getting us to hate each other. Um, but we're um, going to take a hard swing at it uh, and try to help one small step take root uh, across America. We really need to do everything we can right now to see the human being uh, across the divides from us. You know, abortion is an important issue to so many of us, um, guns, voting rights, the environment. But uh, I think the most important issue by far right now, by far, uh, is holding this great country of ours together. So that's one small step. And Kristen, let's do some questions. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. I'm Kristen Beard Adams, President of the City Club Board of Directors. We're joined today by Dave Isay, founder of StoryCorps, talking about uh, one of his initiatives, One Small Step, part of StoryCorps, of course. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those listening via our live stream at cityclub.org or our radio broadcast at 89.7 Ideastream Public Media. If you'd like to tweet a question, do so at the City Club. You can also text your questions to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. May we have our first question, please. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Bobby Kennedy spoke at the City Club on April 5, 1968, the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And his daughter, Carrie, uh, appeared at the City Club 50 years later, and I asked her, well, how is your father able to have a coalition of working class whites and blacks uh, when he won the Indiana primary in 1968? And she said, my father showed up to these communities and he listened. Why is it so difficult for politicians to do that today and for people in general to do that? <laughs> this is not my area of expertise. I mean, I, I think that, um, I, I, I think that um, you know, so, social, we're, 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 we're living in, in, in an increasingly uh, polarized society where, you know, we're rewarded on Twitter and so forth with likes and getting dopamine hits on Facebook for being as outrageous and divisive as possible. So all of the drivers um, uh, that, that kind of exist in this, uh, you, know, the, you know, the great uh, paradox of, of the technological age that we live in is that, you know, it was supposed to help us bring us closer together cell phones and so forth, but it's really in so many ways driven us apart. So there are kind of a myriad of factors that have come together. There's a great, there's a psychologist named uh, John Haidt who wrote a piece in The Atlantic in April called something like, Why Has America Become So Stupid Over the Last 10 Years? And I would suggest that that, that, is, that is about uh, 30 pages that will answer your question in, in great detail. Um, but I, you know, again, from that, if you think about 
you know, we have um, uh, Judge Ryan is, is on the ballot and, and running for office. And, you know, I, I think that, um, and obviously, you know, character really matters. And we heard in that story about a man of, of great character. Bobby Kennedy, you know, when, when, when uh, Juan Romero told that story, it was the first time that anybody had ever heard what Bobby Kennedy's last words were. So it became a big national story. Is everyone all right? You know, and it's hard to imagine, um, you know, uh, many of the politicians today, the first words out of their mouth being, is everyone all right? So, you know, I think part of what we try, we're trying to do as StoryCorps is remind people about who we can be at our best. And the truth is that, you know, again, there are these drivers for this small percentage of the country uh, that, to, that are driving us apart, but that's not really what America is. You know, most of us, most of us are, care about our kids and, you know, want to see this democracy thrive and survive. So unfortunately, it's a small, Tim Dixon, the expert I was talking about before, um, talks about the, um, the margins, the 8% the on either side, liberal and Democrat, whose voices are so loud, but, and are completely outflanking the people who are looking for a democracy that functions better and has leaders like, like Bobby Kennedy and Judge Ryan. Uh, good afternoon. Hi. I, uh, sit on the State Board of Education, and one of our members pr uh, proposed a resolution that is really hate-filled, uh, anti-trans. Uh, it's being discussed on the Ohio Channel Monday at 1230, for those of you who are interested. Uh, my concern, my question is, with, so mu with, with groups in this country spending so much time and money trying to get people to hate each other, um, have you tried bringing teenagers considered straight and anti and trans teenagers, gay teenagers, bringing them together to do a story similar to the ones that are doing you're doing now. We've done every possible permutation of people um, coming together, and you know, uh, Mr. Rogers uh, used to carry around a quote in his wallet from a nun. <coughs> excuse me, a nun in Philadelphia who's still alive. I think she must be in her mid 90s, named Mary Lou Kanaki. Um, and the quote was, uh, it's impossible not to love someone whose story you've heard. Now, that's not true 100% of the time, but like 98% of the time, it is true. And I do think that this, um, you know, getting proximate with each other, talking to each other, you know, that a, a big part of what we, we were just talking, we were just talking about this before I started speaking, you know, that, uh, you know, Mother Teresa said, we've forgotten that we belong to each other. Um, you, you know, people just, people feel that there's so much anger, and a lot of that anger, I think, um, comes from people just feeling like they're not being heard and they're not being respected. This is across the political divides. Um, and, you know, I think if we spent more time listening to each other and less time screaming at each other, just imagine what a stronger country that we would be. Thank you for bringing that up. And we have a lot of stories of trans families on uh, StoryCorps.org, animations and so forth. So, um, and again, not, you know, we don't, that we don't have a political agenda. And, you know, I, I believe that there's a flame of good in everybody, no matter what your politics are. And, you know, our job is to kind of fl fan that flame into a roaring fire, uh, if we can, you know. And, and it's important that, that you know, we, we look for the good in one another. So thank you for that. We don't, we have no, we don't, we don't have a political agenda. Our only agenda is that all of our lives and all of our stories matter equally and infinitely. And if we can hold on to that, I think this country can really, um, can really go places. Thank you. Back. Yes. Hi. I'm a retired CMSD teacher from Collinwood High School. Um, and my question has to do with our America, which some people may not know about. But I'm wondering if you're still in touch with Lee Allen and Lloyd, um, who were basically the authors of this book. Yeah, so before I did, I started StoryCorps, I did radio documentaries for many years. And one of the um, documentaries I did what took place in Chicago, and it was two kids who, growing up in the Ida B. Wells projects that don't exist anymore. They were 13 and 14 at the time. This was 35 years ago. Um, and they, they took tape recorders and documented what their life was like and then wrote a book about this. Yes, um, I'm in touch with them every day. Unfortunately, Lloyd uh, has sickle cell anemia. And he, um, he suffered a stroke about f three and a half months ago. And it's unclear if he's going to survive. So he is um, 45 years old, and we're pulling for him. Um, but he has not come out of his coma yet, and it's not, it's not looking good. And Lee Allen is a football coach. Yeah. My 
question is about, uh, I have family members, uh, cousins that are about 180 degrees different politically. And it is the elephant in the middle of the room in an otherwise good relationships. And is there a way through StoryCorps, with StoryCorps, to engage in that conversation without it blowing up? So we call, we, call, we call it one small step because it's the first small step. And we, you know, we did a lot of testing with one small step before we um, launched it. And we did stuff with family members and decided not to, not to focus on family members because really what, what, we're, what we're looking at in, in one small step is toxic polarization, dehumanization across the divides. We know what happens when, um, when societies dehumanize people. The Germans, uh, Hitler called Jews untermenschen, less than human. You have slavery, you have Rwanda. Uh, we know where polarization can lead. Now in families, we argue, but you, you, ideally, you probably don't want that person dead. So we, so, so we, we, we want, at one small step, we suggest people don't talk about politics. What we're trying to do is build a little bit of social capital so that other people can come in and we can begin to have those conversations. But without the, without the, um, without the, the kind of foundation of seeing the other person as a human being, there's no chance to uh, even begin those conversations. So I would say um, tread lightly. <laughs> And um, you know there may be something we have. We have an app that makes it possible to record StoryCorps interviews anytime, any place, and with one tap, upload them to the Library of Congress. So the safety of that, you know, people kind of bring their best angels in when they know that their great great grandchildren are going to listen to them someday. So you may want to try to just talk to them with the app and just come at some of these issues, um, uh, you, you know, quietly, and also listen to what they have to say, and um, hopefully they'll listen to you as well. Our next Hi. question is a text question. Hi. Okay. What's happening in the first three one small step cities, and how does it work in these cities operationally? Okay. So we have a in, so we have a um, our we we have three cities that we're focused on. Again, we're looking to expand. Um, there we have an air game and a ground game in each city. Uh, basically, we have a list of we have a in order to participate in one small step, you go on to a site, take one small step org, you sign up. Um, and we have, we have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people on a waiting list. If you're in a one small step city, you're at the top of the waiting list. So um, during COVID, we did all of our interviews remotely. We're now moving towards face-to-face um, -face interviews. So in, um, in uh, 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 Wichita, Richmond, Fresno, um, we're actively doing many interviews on the ground with people. And we're also doing um, advertising. We're starting this social norming campaign. So on your social media feeds, you're gonna start to see messaging about the importance of um, listening to one another and the dangers of toxic polarization and starting to see these, um, these uh, uh, videos as well. So the idea is that everybody in the city should know about it. Everyone who wants to participate can participate. And that we'll see, you know, we do, one of the people in that experts list was Joel Benenson, who's a very famous political pollster. Um, and what we'd like to see happen is that the cities um, come to see that, you know, that, that it is um, important and, uh, and gratifying and wonderful to speak to people across the divides and that the temperature goes down in these cities, the, temp the toxic polarization begins to decrease. Yes. The oldest w rule of war and politics is divide and conquer. Yes. How can you stop that between the political parties and most especially the news organizations when they bring a gallon of gasoline and a match to the fight instead of sitting and treating each other civilly? Yep. Thank you. Well, that, so as I said, I mean, it's an absolute David and Goliath fight. But you know the the, the you're, you're absolutely right, and all of the you know all of the rewards go to the dividers. Um, but you know one of the le I've done I've been I've done StoryCorps for 19 years now. We've done hundreds of thousands of interviews. Um, we have facilitators who sit in the booth, and they call it bearing witness to these interviews. We've had more than a thousand of them who serve. They're the core of StoryCorps, who serve a year or two of StoryCorps, and then they go back and do whatever they're going to do with their lives. And if you ask them when they come off the road what they've learned, um, every single one of them gives a version, their first answer of the Anne Frank quote that people are basically good. Um, and that is, you know, there, there might have been some kind of a selection bias when we were in the hundreds and thousands, but when you get to the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, there's got to be some truth to it. So, um, you know, I think StoryCorps in some ways is a hope machine, and we have to, 
you know, we have to we have to just believe that our better angels can prevail. Uh, and you know, Bobby, you know, Bobby Kennedy said uh, in 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 that famous speech, the ripples of hope speech, that with a thousand, if there are a thousand of uh, uh, ripples of hope, that they can rise up and create a wave that. Um, that overcomes, you know, the, the the worst of us, and you know, we are the ripples of hope, and and the good people who are Americans, I think, can overcome this and and say we've had enough. It's just time to say we've had enough. And again, when you look at the polling, those voices are loud, but there is an exhausted majority in the middle. Eighty-six percent of the country does not want this, this, and that eighty-six percent of the country has to speak up. And if we do, um, we'll win. So conclusion, okay, I'm getting the sign from Dan. Um, so um, uh, th thank you for um, being here today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to play um, all these stories, including some depressing ones. It was fun for me at least. Um, uh, thank you for being here at the City Club, I, I appreciate it. I, just, just a final thought. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, I was on the West Coast um, giving a speech, uh, and um, I got to spend time with another participant named Scott uh, Skiles. And uh, Scott was, uh, came to the big, big story core, the family story core, with his son, Zach, uh, a bunch of years ago. Uh, Zach was served three tour tours of duty in Iraq and came back with very, very serious PTSD. They hadn't talked about it before. We have, a, we have these different initiatives that, that serve different verticals in the country, and one of them is uh, military families. And they, they came in and Zach talked to his dad about what, what had happened to him uh, in Iraq. He ended up coming home and becoming homeless and, and um, had just extremely severe PTSD. By the time they talked, Zach was in a rehab program um, and has since gone on to finish college and he's getting, I think he just finished his PhD. Um, but um, Scott, his dad, came to this event and we played the story. Um, uh, and. Um, and when I first met him after playing his story, he handed me a piece of paper and he said, I just want you to have this because it's given me a tremendous amount of strength uh, through the years, you know, dealing with everything that's happened with Zach. And I opened it up and it was a very short quote from a theologian I'd never heard of named Frederick Beekner, who died actually just a couple months ago. Very simple message. It said, um, the Beekner quote was, here is the world, beautiful and terrible things will happen, don't be afraid. So that's my message to you. Um, don't be afraid. Keep up hope when things seem hopeless, when it feels like the odds are completely against us and that this democracy is going to dissolve. Uh, we, have to, we have to fight back and say no, and we can do better than this. And remember that, um, that our neighbors are our neighbors, not our enemies, and this is not a zero-sum game. And if we can do this, um, we're going to leave a better country for our, our kids and our grandkids, which is all any of us want. So thank you so much for your time. I'm going to play one. Do I have time to play one final story, or are we going off the air? OK. Um, so um, one final story of hope. Um, uh, this is a standard story core story. I'm going to read the intro, and, and let's watch. And then we will go off the air and be done, and everyone can go back to, back to work. <laughs> this is a story from Chloe Longfellow. As a child, Chloe Longfellow was close to her grandmother, Doris. At StoryCorps, Chloe remembers the lessons her grandmother taught her, especially in the kitchen. She had red hair. It was red hair out of a bottle, but it was still red hair. And she was a spitfire. If you messed with her and she didn't think it was right, she would tell you. But I do remember that she always smiled with her eyes, even when she was angry, even when she was tired. She was my very first best friend. It's really surprising the amount of life lessons you can learn in a kitchen if you have the right teacher. She used to try to tell me about acceptance and how to be a good human being. She'd get all the ingredients for a soup, and she'd look at it and she'd go, now see, honey, this is how the world works. Some people are onions, some people are potatoes. It'd be a really boring soup if you just put potatoes in there, wouldn't it? But if you had leeks, if you add some bacon, then you make this wonderful thing. And all these different people come together to make this wonderful thing called our world. And one time, she had grown some beets. We brought them in, cleaned them off, and I got to move the page in the cookbook. And I had beet juice all over my hands, and I left a little tiny handprint on her cookbook. 
And I started to cry because I thought I had ruined it. That was grandma's favorite book. But she took a piece of beet and she covered her hand and she put her handprint on the other side and made our thumbs touch in the print and said, it's perfect now. If I really miss her, I just open the book and go back to that page. She touched it so often that it still smells like her, even all these years later. She used to tell me that the sky was black velvet and the stars were holes that had been punched in the ceiling of heaven. And that was how our loved ones looked down at us and saw if we were doing wrong or if we were doing right or just check in on us every so often. So every time I look up at the sky, she's there. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, I say, for joining us at the City Club of Cleveland. We would also like to thank Ulmer and Byrne for their support of today's forum, which is the Samuel O. Friedlander Memorial Forum on Free Speech. Mr. Friedlander was a member of the City Club most of his life, serving as president in 1962 during the City Club's 50th anniversary year. His daughter, Nina Friedlander Gibbons, one of the first women member, mem female members of the City Club who is here with us today, along with his granddaughter, Wendy. Um, we thank you so much for your support of the City Club and for being here today. Um, we would also like to welcome guests at tables by IdeaStream Public Media, Almer and Byrne, and the United Way of Greater Cleveland. We're so happy to have all of you here today. Next week at the City Club, we welcome Congresswoman Liz Cheney on Tuesday, November 1st. She will be in conversation with PBS NewsHour's Judy Woodruff. Uh, tickets are sold out for this forum, but you can tune in to the live broadcast at noon on 89.7 IdeaStream Public Media or at the live stream, uh, our live stream on cityclub.org. Then on Wednesday, November 2nd, we are back at the Happy Dog in Cleveland's Gordon Square neighborhood, taking on, uh, taking on particip participatory budgeting. Erica Anthony of Cleveland Votes will be moderating that discussion. And finally, on Friday, November 4th, we will discuss how empathy can be used to improve police response and engagement in our neighborhoods. You can find out more about these forums, purchase tickets, and learn more about other upcoming events at, city, at cityclub.org. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you once again to Dave I say Thank you, members, friends, and guests of the City Club. I'm Kristen Baird-Adams, and this forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.